and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for February 2022 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Sethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks, and we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few months as well. There's chapter titles if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story, and if I mention any scientific research articles, they're all going to be linked in the video description down below if you want to read them yourself. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. All right, so as we get later into February, we are going to have to say a sad goodbye to Jupiter in our evening skies as it gets ever closer towards the sun from our perspective here on Earth. Those of us up north might just be able to glimpse it very low on the horizon after sunset still, but if you're in the southern hemisphere, the angle is all wrong. It's already gone for you, unfortunately. By the end of February, it's going to be gone for the rest of us too because it's going to be behind the sun from our perspective here on Earth. We have to wait till the end of March for it to pop out the other side again so that it'll be visible in the morning sky with all the other visible naked eye planets in the solar system. The solar system is really just stacked on one side at the minute because in February in the morning sky just before sunrise you can currently see Venus and Mars if you're in the northern hemisphere but if you're in the southern hemisphere you'll see both Venus, Mars, Mercury and Saturn in the direction towards the sunrise. It's a great time to look out for planets as well you know close to sunrise because as the, the sunrise and gets closer to the horizon, you know, more and more light sort of bleeds out into the sky, that sort of twilight phase just before dawn, and it washes out a lot of the stars in the sky. So really all you can see is the bright planets and it makes picking them out if you don't know what you're looking for that much easier. Plus, it's going to be made even easier on the 27th of February, Sunday the 27th in the morning when the crescent moon or the toenail moon, as I like to call it, I even wore little toenail moon earrings today, you know, just especially for this, will actually be pairing up with Venus and Mars in the morning sky. So Venus is going to be the brighter of the two and Mars the much fainter reddish one, like really look out for how much brighter Venus actually is. And that should be visible wherever you are in the world, but it will be higher in the sky the further south you are. I'm actually going to be back in the Maldives by the 27th of February, so I'm really hoping to be able to capture this as well if we have a clear sky and a clear morning. Can you can you tell I'm excited? <laughs> the moon will then keep dropping lower to the horizon and getting that ever, ever thinner crescent so that by Tuesday the 1st of March, it'll actually be pairing up with Mercury and Saturn much closer to the horizon before dawn. But this is only going to be visible for those of you in the southern hemisphere and nearer to the equator because for us up north, it's going to be below the horizon, unfortunately. Not to worry if you missed that though, because Saturn will continue to rise higher in the sky through March, and you should be able to spot the trio of Venus, Mars, and Saturn by the 20th of March. This is when Venus will actually reach its highest point in the sky, its furthest point from the sun from our perspective here on Earth that we call its greatest western elongation. If you have binoculars or a telescope, you should definitely break them out for this, because you'll be able to see Venus's like half moon phase as well while it's in that position at elongation. All right, that's enough for looking up at the beautiful night sky for now let's come back down to earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. So as has apparently become the norm now for Night Sky News, let's start with an update on the James Webb Space Telescope, shall we? It has arrived at its final orbital position around the sun, the Lagrange Point 2. Thankfully, the final course correction fuel burn that brought it into that orbit all went swimmingly, and there was just this huge collective sigh of relief that went up around the world. Since it's got there, there was also the news now that all of the instruments, the detectors that are actually going to detect and record the light that the telescope actually collects have all now successfully been switched on. So the MIRI instrument was actually switched on during the unfolding process a couple of weeks ago, but now NearCam, NearSpec, and the FGS have all been booted up as well, which is just great news. If you want to know more about what each of those instruments is going to do on the James Webb Space Telescope, check out my intro to JWST video that I did a few months ago. Once they were all switched on, they could start detecting light for the first time. And this is exactly what happened at the start of February. NearCam was switched on and recorded photons of light from a star. Hey, oh, editing Becky jumping in here. So when I was filming this video on Friday, sort of like late afternoon, I said something like, 
but they're not going to release this image because it won't look great. It won't look like what we expect James Webb images to look like once all the calibration and the alignment's done, right? It would be fuzzy right now. You'd actually see whatever they were looking at 18 times because each individual mirror is pointing in a different direction. So that it's not all working together to focus the light. And so they wouldn't release it because people would be like, oh, is, is that what we paid all this money for? And, you know, you need all of this explanation to go with it. Little did I know that pretty much at exactly the same time as I was filming, NASA released just that. The first light detected from a single star just seen 18 times because we have a cross-eyed telescope still. So each dot is where light has come in from the star, reflected off one of Webb's 18 hexagonal mirror segments and into the wrong place on the detector. So to do this, they're using a very bright star called HD 84406. It's actually a sunlight star that's you know not too bright, not too faint in the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear, more commonly called the Plow or the Big Dippets just to the right of the top star in the pan if you want to find it in the sky yourself and stare and wave in the same direction. They've actually managed to figure out which dot of HD 84406 on this image is from each of the individual segments. And so now what they'll do is they'll use this image to tweak the angle and position of each mirror. In some cases, you know, by less than a millimeter even, that the precision they're working with is incredible. And what they'll do is bring all those 18 dots into focus and into the center of the detector so that all 18 segments are working together as one much larger 6.5 meter diameter mirror as originally intended. What's really cool to see as well is that NearCam, which is the detector they were using here to get this image, has sort of like a pinhole camera mode. It's not going to be used for science observations. It's only ever going to be used in this sort of engineering alignment phase. But with it, you can actually see those individual mirror segments. And so they also released that image as well, sort of as the telescope was pointing one segment directly at a bright star. And then you can see this sort of like ghostly outline of the 18 segments all nicely unfolded in space. And you can see why they'd use this for the alignment phase as well. You can actually see gaps between each of the mirrors where the light is leaking. You can see they're not aligned and all perfectly working together. And it gives a really good visual sort of sanity check of what's going on with the telescope. So if you were thinking like, is that it when the image was released? Like, is that what we should expect from JWST images? Don't worry, it's only going to get better from here. You know, as the web team goes through all of these many alignment and calibration steps to bring everything together in very high precision, the images are only going to get clearer, better focused as well in higher resolution. There's actually a great blog on the NASA website if you want to check it out about how many steps are actually in this focusing alignment process and it breaks it down really nicely so you know why it's going to take so long. The other big like space mission news this month was actually quite sad. It was that NASA announced that the International Space Station will be decommissioned with no more astronauts visiting by 2030 and it'll actually be brought out of orbit what we call deorbit deorbited is that a word i don't know but it will be brought out of its orbit in january 2031 it will partly burn up in the atmosphere with splashdown at point nemo the point on earth in the pacific ocean that's most distant from any land it's often referred to as the spacecraft cemetery because there's just so much space junk there it's sad news yes but the international space station is getting old it, you know it's already starting to show its age and we knew it couldn't live forever. And you know, at some point there will be a successor to the International Space Station that we can get excited about as well. In the meantime, I really hope they actually recover some of the pieces of the International Space Station that do splash down at Point Nemo. A, because I'm not really comfortable with polluting the ocean even more with more space junk, but also because I think for prosperity's sake as well, like how incredible would it be to have a piece of the International Space Station like at your local science museum or space museum, whatever, and how inspirational that would be to so many different people. Speaking of space junk, the International Astronomical Union announced the formation of a collection of astronomy organizations that have been brought together to form the Center for the Protection of Dark and Quiet Skies from Satellite Constellation Interference. So this is essentially a coordinated effort by astronomers all around the world who are trying to mitigate the negative effects of these huge constellations of like tens of thousands of satellites and the likes of uh, Starlink and OneWeb on professional astronomy. So they're trying to, you know, push for policy changes or design changes or even mitigate the, the damaging effects through sort of the development of new software that can communicate with the satellites and astronomers to warn us if a satellite is going overhead. 
So the name of the initiative mentions dark skies for visible light astronomy because of, you know, the, the streaks of light you get across your images that's from the, the reflection off these satellites, but also quiet skies for radio astronomy too, because the communications between these satellites and the ground, you know, happen in the same radio frequencies that the radio telescope is trying to pick up. So they're a huge source of, of noise, of interference, essentially when the telescope is trying to observe like huge patches of the sky as radio telescopes tend to do. And even the ones that up there, you know, before they even started launching these, these big constellation satellites were an issue, but these huge constellations, the many more that have been put up there in recent years are already starting to cause havoc on radio astronomy. So you've got the Square Kilometre Array organization heading this initiative up in the UK. If you want to know more about the SK and why these constellations of satellites affect it so much, check out last week's video on five big new telescopes that we've got to look forward to uh, in the next decade. And you'll realize, you know, why these constellations of satellites are such a big deal. You know, they've been worrying a lot of astronomers for a while. How would it, you know, affect professional astronomy and the science we can do going forward? So I'm really pleased to see this, this collective, this, this initiative of everyone coming together to try and do something about it. Of course, if the sun has its way, then we won't have to worry because about 40 of these newly launched SpaceX Starlink satellites that are going to join the constellation were actually knocked out by a solar flare as well due to the energy that they were impacted with. And they actually fell out of orbit and put on a rather spectacular light show as they came back to Earth. Okay, right, let's chat about the really exciting stuff now, because you know I just I just want to talk about new astrophysics research results, right? And I want to start with this paper by Pachetti and collaborators that claims to have found what's known as an intermediate mass black hole. The missing link between stellar mass black holes when a star dies and goes supernova that we find, you know, dotted across our galaxy, and a supermassive black hole that we find in the centers of galaxies. You know, we've measured these stellar mass black holes with masses of up to around about 100 times the mass of the sun in the Milky Way. And then we've measured supermassive black holes dotted, you know, in the centers of galaxies all across the universe, anywhere from a million times the mass of the sun to tens of billions times the mass of the sun. But we've never really found anything concrete in the region in between. And it raises this question of, well, if a supernova is the only way that we know to create a black hole, and that creates a black hole that's, say, 10 times the mass of the sun, how on earth does then that grow to become millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. So the best options for finding these intermediate mass black holes are either at the center of smaller dwarf galaxies, and there's a few candidates for that, like the black hole in NGC 4395, that's thought to be around about 360,000 times the mass of the sun. But then there's the question of, well, is that just like the tail end of the supermassive black hole distribution instead? Or you've got the option of finding them in the center of big star clusters in galaxies like in the Andromeda galaxy, which is what this study has claimed to have found. Supposedly in Andromeda's largest star cluster right on the outskirts of the disk of Andromeda, well away from its supermassive black hole in the center. What they did was actually look at the rotation of the stars in this globular cluster. Now, unfortunately, not with the same detail as like the stars orbiting around the center of the Milky Way, where we actually see the individual stars moving and contract their orbits, which is what won the, the Nobel Prize back in 2020. But instead, we're just looking at the average overall rotation in this cluster. So if the cluster is rotating, some of the stars are coming towards you and some of them are moving away from you. So one side of the cluster will have its like blue shifted, you know, sort of squished to shorter wavelength, which is bluer colors. And one side of the cluster moving away from you will have its light stretch to longer wavelength, which are redder colors. And if you subtract the overall movement of the entire Andromeda galaxy coming towards the Milky Way off of that, you can actually pick out this rotation of this individual cluster. And then you can see how the rotation changes with the distance from the center of the cluster. So this is actually the same data as you just saw, but it's just in one dimension now. We're just sort of plotting out as a curve. And the shape of that curve will depend on how much mass is in the cluster, right? Add a bit more in the center or on the outskirts and it will change the rotation. We can work out how much mass is in this cluster from, you know, just the number of stars that we can see and how bright they are and how they're distributed as well. We can literally see, okay, where are more stars? Are they in the middle? Are they here in this radius or are they right on the outskirts? And therefore we can work out how much mass is at each radius and then model what the rotation should be based on our knowledge of gravity. And when the authors of this paper did that, they found that it doesn't match the data that they found. So the data are shown in red here and it just doesn't match 
match the model we have for how it should be rotating with how many stars we see and how much mass we know is there that's shown in blue. Instead, the model that they find actually matches the data is shown in the gray line here. And it's a model that has a lot more mass concentrated in the center of the cluster, 91,000 times the mass of the sun to be precise. And this mass of 91,000 times the mass of the sun can't be giving out light, otherwise we would see it in the image we take of the Andromeda galaxy and this cluster that's been observed. So this is why it's an candidate intermediate mass black hole because we're not 100% sure that it definitely is a black hole. You know, this this mass that we can't see could be just like a, a clump of, of dark matter or something like that, right? That's a lot more spread out rather than the very concentrated black hole. But our models are telling us there has to be something there and the most likely culprit is that it probably is an intermediate mass black hole. Now, since this is on the outskirts of Andromeda, Pachetti and collaborators actually discussed the possibility that this actually isn't like a stellar cluster star cluster that's formed in Andromeda, but it could be the core of a much smaller galaxy that had like the rest of its stars on the outskirts stripped away in a merger with Andromeda. And this clump is essentially all that's left, which is a really intriguing result to think about as well. So I really liked this paper. I really like this piece of work. And I'm really intrigued to see if we can start finding more of these intermediate mass black holes, perhaps turning them from like candidate to confirmed intermediate mass black holes as well with the next generation of telescopes that are coming online in the next couple of years. Speaking of papers I liked, actually, I really like this paper on Saturn's rotation rate this month so much that I've actually decided to do a whole video on it instead of doing it in Night Sky News. Because if you remember, I, a few years back, I actually did a video on sort of the unsolved mystery of Saturn's rotation rate. And I figured it was only fair to like follow up that video with its own. And I'm also going to interview the researchers behind this study as well, because I know you always love to hear from them. But for now, I want to talk about this paper instead, which isn't about Saturn. If it isn't about Saturn, it's clearly going to be about black holes again. <laughs> like if you know me at all, it was this paper on two supermarkets massive black holes which are about to merge, which Jiang and collaborators, the authors of this paper, reckon could be anywhere from 100 to 300 days away, right? Sounds like a lot, but on astronomical timescales where, you know, usually we're talking about millions to billions of years, this is an imminent merger that could be happening this year. Like, we have never observed anything like that before this is incredibly rare and can you tell how excited I am? So the way they've spotted this is by looking at the amount of light received over time from the center of this galaxy, STSS J1430 plus 2303. I know, so poetic, isn't it? But it's just because it's like a fairly generic galaxy that's been spotted in one of these huge galaxy surveys of the entire sky known as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And they're just all known by their coordinates, you know, to identify them instead of naming on the, you know, the a million different galaxies that you end up spotting in this survey. Anyway, this galaxy is known to have a growing supermassive black hole in the center. It's got a disk of gas that is slowly spiraling down to become part of the black hole. And in doing so, the gas gets accelerated to huge speeds so much that it starts to glow. It gives off light from the optical, like visible light we can see with our eyes, all the way up to X-ray light. And we can see that because the gas is well out from the event horizon of the black hole. You're really seeing light from the gas and not light from the black hole. But on further inspection of this glowing gas orbiting the black hole in this galaxy, this light that they detect is actually variable. But it's not randomly variable. It's very periodic, right? Like a sine wave. It repeats. But you'll notice in this part that the time between each repetition is decreasing. So three years ago, when they were observing this galaxy, they noticed that this pattern, this sine wave curve would take 12 months. It would take 12 months for it to go up and go down and come back again to the same place and repeat. Now, when they observe this same galaxy, they notice that the pattern repeats every month. So instead of taking 12 months for it to go down and come back up again, it only takes a month. It's been decreasing so much in that span of just three years. And the best way that we have to explain that strange variation that is decreasing is if there's two supermassive black holes. There's an extra one that's orbiting the one that has the gas disk around it. And as they orbit each other and this one passes in front, it causes this, this dip and then increase in brightness again. And obviously to get it decreasing, it means that the orbit between the two must also be decreasing. So they're slowly getting closer and closer together. 
So that suggests that these two black holes are going to merge one day. And that's what Jiang and collaborators tried to model, you know, how long it would actually take for them to finally merge. And it is a bit uncertain. It depends on lots of different things and the things that you assume in your models. But essentially, their models give them anywhere between 100 and 300 days and up to three years if they just use optical data and not the x-ray data they have as well. So if they're right with their estimate of 100 to 300 days, that means this is happening in 2022. So it's definitely something to get excited for. And I feel like this paper was a little bit of like a heads up guys, like train all the telescopes on this thing so that we don't miss it. Because this gas that's spiraling around one of the black holes is going to put on a bit of a light show as another one comes into the picture and gets even closer. We should see this, you know, from radio wavelengths to visible wavelengths to x-ray and gamma rays, even in neutrinos as well, right? And that will be incredibly exciting. We'd learn so much about the dynamics of black holes and the gravity around them and how two supermassive black holes would even interact as well with such huge forces at play. Because as I said, this is something we have never seen before. And to an astronomer, that's very exciting. Now, ideally, we would detect the gravitational waves from this merger of these two supermassive black holes as well with the likes of LIGO and Virgo, but they are only sensitive to gravitational waves from much smaller, these stellar mass black holes that are only 10 to 100 times the mass of the sun. I've made a video before on why that is, if you want to know why they're only sensitive to the smaller black hole mergers, not these massive black hole mergers, if you want to check that out. There are actually plans for a much bigger gravitational wave detector in space called LISA that will be able to detect gravitational waves from these supermassive black holes, but that's not due until the late 2030s. So we're going to be a little bit late to pick up the gravitational waves from this imminent merger if it does actually turn out to be imminent, you know, within the next 100 or 300 days or so, as the paper claims and the models suggest. But we're still going to learn a lot from it if we manage to capture all the different light sources from it as well across all the different wavelengths. And we'll then know what to look for and look out for in the sky so that we can spot more of these in the future. All right, that's it for this month's night sky news. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky, send them my way over on social media because I'd always love to see them and I love sharing my favorites as well, you know, from all around the world. It's such a lovely community that we have here. If you don't know how to take pictures of the night sky or if every time you've tried it, it's just come out looking a little bit naff, then don't worry, I've got you because my next video is gonna be all about how to do it with all of my tips and tricks on how to use your phone or your camera to, to capture the wonders of the night sky so make sure you look out for that one until then though happy stargazing everyone before we get to the bloopers i just want to say a big thank you to this week's video sponsor brilliant watching and engaging with videos like this is great for learning new stuff but if you want to step up your learning to the next level with like interactive hands-on courses you've got to check out brilliant it's an online learning platform that helps you get like a deeper understanding of concepts in science or maths or computer science by taking you through an idea like step by step and in, in like this fun interactive way. It's really hands on, you're learning by doing, which is the way that I personally learn best as well. And Brilliant has a great course on scientific thinking that explains the physics of, you know, everyday things, right? Without all the maths and, and the number crunching, just, just building your physical intuition. I think it's just something that gets a little bit lost sometimes when we're taught science at school. You know, I see so many students applying to university who just know how to plug numbers into equations, but don't stop to think about what it actually means, right? This course from Brilliant gets you to stop and just think for a little bit. So if that sounds like something you'd be up for, to get started for free, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description down below. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link are gonna get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for continuing to support this channel. And now, roll those bloopers. With me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. I can't even pronounce my own name today. <gasps> We've essentially still got like a cross-eyed telescope, you know, just giving us these fuzzy blobs, like notch, like sharp pinbrinks of pinbrinks. Let's do that again. Um, We've essentially got like a cross-eyed telescope still, right? Like we've not got like beautiful clear, crystal clear images. They're just fuzzy blobs. You know, we don't have the, what we expect, which is, you know, these pinbrinks of pinbrinks. Ah! <laughs> did it again. You know, like a, a, a star clustered, it would, star clustered? 
I think I've got like custard on the brain. <laughs> Name all the million galaxies you end up spottinging. Spottinging? Sam's just come up and said, Joyce, put some wine in the fridge for when you finish filming. I was like, it's the Pope Catholic.